let's talk about how women behave during divorce. So this is infused in here because this is going to happen to 50% of the people that are going to get married. If you're a second time round marriage, I think the number is higher, like 75 to 80%, third time is even higher than that. It's just a disaster. Um, anyway, so how women behave. So between the combination of family law and female nature, women are motivated to behave incredibly poorly to the father of their children during the divorce. I'm assuming that there's children in the equation because really there's no point in getting married if you're not going to have kids. It's it's utterly pointless in my view. Don't do it. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you straight up, Rich, should I get married and not have kids? No, don't do it. It's stupid. There are significant female-centric financial rewards that are that have been well written into family law, encourage them to be the sole custodial parent of the children. By becoming the parent that is a primary custody of the children, that gives primary custody or care to the kids, uh, money and all decision-making capacity goes to the parent awarded custody, which eight times out of 10 is the woman. Now, I, I'm gonna pause for a second to say, I'm not a lawyer. If you need legal advice, talk to a lawyer where you live. And in fact, before any of you Muppets out there decide to get married, you need to screw your head on right and buy at least an hour of time from a family lawyer that deals with divorce on a regular basis where you live to find out what you could be marching into. You want to know exactly what the slaughterhouse looks like so you can make an informed decision. You may want to move to another state or province that's more favorable to fathers if you're hell bent on getting married. That might be one of the conditions that has to be met. And if she's truly in your frame and sees you as her best possible option, she will follow. Right. But this is just something that I wanted to pause for the cause and clarify for you. So eight times out of 10, women still get custody of the kids. Um, now, women are opportunistic by nature. It's hardwired into them. It's part of the reason why we as sapiens are successful species. Right. Uh, this is what solipsism is. Without opportunism, her children were less likely to survive. You can't blame women for this. It's an evolved survival mechanism. The problem, though, is that everything in family law is built into it to be able to take advantage and optimize uh, that part of female nature, right? I mean, it's no surprise. Anyway. So women need the skill, obviously, to find the best provisioning mate to optimize their hypergamy. If you give someone that's naturally opportunistic incentive to benefit for at another's expense, then guess what? They will do it, OK? Part of human nature. People are self-interested. Men and women. Women are more, you know, from the sense of solipsism. You know, you can always tell the differences from this phrase because when they tell women to, to do something that's right, what they say is they do, you do what's right for you, girl, right? But when they tell guys to do what's right, they say, you got to do what's right. You know, basically like stand up, be the stand up kind of guy and take one for the team, right? Because guys are disposable. Women are the protective sex because, you know, sex is just the way that it is. Um, oh, I, I skipped the part on marriage, actually. So I just remembered. So Stephanie Coots wrote a, a book on the, uh, I think it's called either the origin of marriage or the history of marriage. It's several pages back. I'm not going to scroll. You'll find it when you read the book. It's something that I recommend that you check out. But the original purpose of marriage had nothing to do with love. It was all about the acquisition of in-laws, meaning you weren't going to survive. You weren't going to do well in the world if you weren't part of a tribe where you had in-laws that had certain capacities and skills and capabilities and strengths and financial resources and influence. That was what marriage was all about. It was about the acquisition of in-laws. You wanted bigger farmland, more oxen, more goats, larger uh plot to pop out all your your kids you know to sire those children of course and it's interesting when i was going through that book there was actually quite a few times throughout history where men by default had custody of the kids if there was ever a divorce um everything that they went through uh legal records uh journals diaries all that stuff nobody got married for love it was all about the acquisition of in-laws that was that you know that took a back seat if that existed then that was great but for the most part, it didn't, right? So you just have to understand that. <clears throat> so it's only in, in recent history, like today, over the last, I'm going to say, 25 to 50 odd years, that female opportunism has had the full backing of the state behind it as family law, right? Prior to 100, 150 years ago, it just didn't exist. Mm. And when the father got custody of the children, he would often retain all the family assets, including what she brought to the table. 
they've they've completely flipped the script on this. Go read Marriage of History. Interesting book. Very, very interesting book. <clears throat> now, this is this is one of the problems um, with the whole divorce situation is once the custodial parent has those rights, they they can make unilateral decisions without the other parent's consent. <clears throat> Let me translate that for you. They can do whatever the hell they want without the other parent's input. So you contribute 50% of the DNA to the child's equation, but you have no say in medical procedures, uh, what school they go to, what religion they follow, where they live. Any number of things can happen depending on where you live, up to including changing the kid's last name to the new guy that gets brought into the family. Uh, you know, the Brady Bunch is incorrect. You know, created, they try to infuse families. What do they call it? Blending the family. He brings two or three, uh, you know, in tow from his prior marriage. You know, she's, of course, got your kids most of the time. He ends up seeing your kids more than you do, and they end up with his last name. Stuff like this happens. You know, a lot of guys, what? what are you talking about? That's not, that's not, cut. it happens. It happens more than you think, right? I mean, there's so many different scenarios that I could go through here to kind of, um, you know, expand and dive down on it. But this would literally take six hours for me to list them all. But here we go. Um, so we've talked about custodial rights, how women are incented to behave badly during the divorce. Let's talk about alimony, also known as maintenance. It's the first level of responsibility. Men often pay their ex-wives. So if you're the breadwinner in the house and she doesn't work or earns significantly less, like you said, stay home, look after the kids. Um, you know, we've got three of them. You're going to stay home and, and, and raise them until they go to school. Um, the problem that you run into, I mean, the benefit, of course, is that that's the best way to raise them. Um, statistically speaking, I suppose, based on the evidence that I've seen anyway. But then you run into the problem of if she wants to divorce your ass seven years down the road when that's usually the first round. <clears throat> and uh, guess what? She's been the primary caregiver. She's been at home, you know, raising the kids. She hasn't worked. You're on the hook for alimony. Depending on where you live in the world, you could be on the hook for alimony for life, right? Um there's there's all kinds of complications that come with that, and it's not it's not just you know basic living expenses like oh here's three thousand dollars a month and uh, you know you have your apartment paid for and you know you're good to go you don't have to worry about everything everything's good sweetheart no 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 if you're making a lot of money you're making half a million a million dollars a year and uh, you get divorced and you got to pay alimony. You're gonna make you're gonna be maintaining the lifestyle that she had while she was married after you get divorced. You're essentially paying for your lifestyle today times two. Okay. You're gonna have to maintain two homes. I mean, most guys end up downsizing their home or or buying some shittier place, or they move out of the matrimony home and let her keep it. But you're maintaining two homes if she didn't work, if she didn't have the ability to work. So that's a very expensive cost. You know, all these strong, independent women that don't need no man all of a sudden need no man when he's got the ability to pay $20,000 a month in alimony to her. They need that man then, right? But any other time, they don't need no man, right? Again, you have 100% responsibility, even after divorce now, after you break up, you go back 500 years ago, you didn't have any responsibility if you got divorced. She'd have to figure it out on her own. She'd go back to her family, work in a brothel, not your problem. You ended up having all the assets and custody of the kids. Today, this is just the tip of the iceberg. We're just talking about alimony here right now. Let me grab this uh, super chat. Laughing Lark. In Mad Men, when Betty wanted to divorce Don, her lawyer warned her that she would lose the kids and her home. That was the 60s. Yeah, so if if that's the way they did it in the 60s, it wasn't that far off that, you know, divorce was not attractive to women. Today, it's very attractive to women. I'm going to show you an exact example here, how the state, how the government actually encourages women to divorce men and become single mothers. Anyway, so you're upkeep. So you're responsible for the upkeep of the standard of living after the marriage ends. Doesn't matter, you know, what that looks like. It's it's not, you know, well, I feel like giving her three thousand. It's no, you have to maintain her standard of living after that. Could be for life. You know, in some places like California, if you were married for ten years plus, it could be for life. Let's talk about child support. Child support is paid to the custodial parent to cover the cost of raising the children. Now, contrary to popular belief, the payment amount is not based on what the children actually need to survive. So if you're a father, you're taking care of, I don't know, a three-year-old, uh, you got transitional diapers, a little bit of clothes, maybe a little bit of childcare, maybe your total uh, monthly cost food, you know, meals, you know, 
maybe your total monthly cost is thousand dollars a month. Okay. For child support for that child. It, it's not based on what the child actually needs to survive. It's rather based on state issued tables. So I put here in uh, the chapter, I had a friend that calculated that during his marriage, his monthly cost look after his kid for food and everything was around 500 bucks a month. The state issued child support tables, however, compelled him to legally and forcibly pay $4,367 every single month. Child support for the most part goes to the mother, not the kids. So we have the first layer, which is alimony, which goes to the mother, then child support. Even if a kid needs $1,000 a month, okay, to, to, to survive, you know, for its necessities. And of course, you're going to want to pay that. It's your child, right? Why the hell wouldn't you want to pay it? But if the child needs a thousand, why aren't you paying a thousand? Why are you paying 4,367? Where does the extra $3,367 go to? And there's no accounting for it, by the way. Okay. There's, there's no accounting for her to you as a father with what she does with that money. And, oh, by the way, it's, after tax money, right? So the tax consequences here anyway in Canada are very, very high. So take it for what it is. Anyway, so that's the way child support works, generally speaking, on a balance of probabilities. Uh, let's talk about matrimonial assets. So matrimonial assets are divided after the knot is untied, usually 50-50. So you take everything that you acquired through the uh, course of the marriage, you shove it in a big pile, you cut it down the middle, you take half, piss off, this is mine, and you stay on your side. That's basically, generally speaking, the way that it works if you've been married for a long time and you don't have a prenup that uh, speaks to that issue. Uh, da -da -da. Although places like Australia where more than half of the assets can be awarded to the mother. <sighs> Shocking, right? So every asset you acquire before or after your nuptials goes in a pile, you split it them. Okay, we talked about that. Now, prenuptials can, in some areas, protect this, but... They're not very effective, if I'm being honest. You have to have a prenup, ideally a postnup, meaning after you sign your nuptials, you have a, another agreement that basically says nothing's changed. We're still agreeing to this. We've signed. We still love each other. We hope nothing changes. But this is, you know, this is the rule of law that we're going to follow. Now, here's the problem, though. If you're all of a sudden like, okay, let's go have those three kids, um, and then I'm going to go to work, and I'm going to bring home the bacon, and she's going to cook it up, and she raises the kids. And she's done that for eight to 10 years. And again, she hasn't worked. And of course, uh, the argument that the state will make is, well, her skills are out of date. You know, she's no longer able to go into the workforce and make the $50,000 a year she was before she got married because 10 years have passed. She's raised three kids. Her skill set has changed. She needs to update her, her skills. She can't afford to do that. So let's put her on alimony and child support and we'll let, you know, the pleb over here take care of all that while he watches her alienate him from the kids. That's usually what ends up happening. But anyway, so the prenup, going back to that, if that 10 years has passed and you haven't refreshed it or you haven't updated it, which most people don't do, I mean, it just doesn't happen, then guess what? It's worthless. It's, it's like toilet paper. It's basically worth toilet paper, okay? Um, the state doesn't deprive women and what they call the best interests of the children, but the they're not really looking after the best interests of the children. <clears throat> they don't let women uh, fall flat on their feet, right? We can't let women fall flat on their feet. Fall flat on their feet. You know, um, I think I was watching Rolo the other day on a, a cast, and he said something to the degree of, "We treat women like children today," and he's right. He's not wrong because they won't let women fall flat on their feet and figure it out, you know, for themselves. If he has the financial resources, guess what? Moo! Mm -hmm. Let's milk him. And transfer them over here, right? But it's it's in excess. It's excessive is the point that I'm making, right? Um, you know, these strong, independent women that don't need no man, if they can get a job or at least get by on a bare minimum of three or four thousand dollars until they figure something out, and they don't make their problems men's problems, then guess what? They're less likely to want to behave badly, especially during the course of the divorce or even in the marriage, and ruin things. But there's no incentive for women to behave well. They can behave. They can go and bang every dude they want. They can bang your kid's soccer coach, uh, the guy that teaches them jujitsu. She can go and bang the yoga instructor. She can she can go on a tear and ride the carousel for all she wants and videotape it and have it playing on the TV when he comes home. And that still doesn't change any of this. None of it changes. None of it. 
no fault divorce, right? Anyway, since men rarely stay home to raise the, the kids and women are hypergamous in their mate selection, meaning they always marry up, you can always expect the guy to transfer wealth over to her through the state. And it's excessive again. Um, bu -bu -bum -bum. Okay. Again, hypergamy doesn't care if she vows with love to be with you and richer or poorer in sickness and health till death do us part. Does not care. Okay. Uh, do, 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 do. Let's see what else we got here. Divorce. This is an interesting one because Mackenzie Bezos was one that got divorced earlier this year or last year, whatever it was, but she became the richest woman in the world by way of divorce. Divorce, not career or entrepreneurship, is statistically still the number one way that women acquire their wealth today, right? Strong, independent women acquiring their wealth through divorce. They didn't have it before they got into it, but they definitely get it on the exit strategy. So you can see how women are not encouraged to behave well and to stay married to men. Don't like it? You know, you think you can do better somewhere else? You go, girl. You do what's right for you. Divorce is ass. Take half of all the shit custody of the kids. You'll make all the decisions. You'll get alimony and child support. You go find the new guy, right? You can do better. 